They are known as assault-style weapons and have been used in some of the country's deadliest shootings. From Uvalde, Tulsa, and El Paso to Parkland, San Bernardino, and Sandy Hook, the high-powered assault rifle has been the weapon of choice for many of the killers. Light is hot. The Los Angeles Police Department demonstrates an AR-style semi-automatic rifle for us on the department's gun range. You have a 16-inch to 20-inch barrel. You have a stock that is shouldered. You are going to be accurate at farther distances as opposed to a pistol. Not to mention, like some other weapons, it can fire a bullet with enough power to pierce soft body armor, something Sergeant James Zaboravan knows firsthand. Oh, jeez. It's definitely an automatic weapon. He took assault weapons fire during the now infamous 1997 North Hollywood shootout, where two bank robbers wearing body armor fired on police for nearly an hour, injuring eight people and 12 officers, including Sergeant Zaboravan. You're being hit with pieces of the vehicles we were hiding behind, uh, asphalt, uh, radiator fluid. Felt like we were being stung by bees. That shooting changed policy, prompting the LAPD and other departments to upgrade their own weaponry to counter the increasingly powerful guns used by assailants. That firepower from weapons is studied inside a ballistics lab at Wayne State University, where researchers simulate a bullet's impact on the human body. It's a block of 20% gelatin, and it's meant to represent the human tissues, so soft tissues. Watch as Cynthia Burr's team fires a handgun round at 1,000 feet per second into the gelatin block. For this particular round, you'll see the bullet come in on this side. You see this temporary cavity here happening. So that expansion is what happens in the body, and then it collapses down. So that's where your damage comes in. Now watch as a team fires a round from an assault rifle. We see a lot more disruption. This round actually breaks apart. It doesn't exit, so it's about 3,000 feet per second, and all of that energy goes into the soft tissue. Um, we have a piece of plastic here to reflect to do the videos, and it actually lifted the plastic up off the table with the energy. An aftermath photo of the handgun round shows a relatively straight line through the tissue, exiting the other side. But not so with the round from an AR-15. It basically goes into the body and creates an explosion inside the body. Trauma surgeons say the wound from an assault rifle can be catastrophic. And the worst part is in a child, all the vital organs are that much closer together. So each of those bullets causes, you know, irreversible damage. In Uvalde, Texas, families were asked for DNA swabs to help the authorities identify their children. As a mom, it really affects me, right? Because um, I cannot imagine having a child endure this. And with high-capacity magazines, suspects can shoot for much longer. Now, the discussion about high-capacity magazines largely centers on reducing the amount of time that a suspect can fire without having to reload. As a former FBI agent, we were trained to quickly get your weapon reloaded and back up on target. But for a suspect, for example, who isn't trained, you can see using this training weapon, that is a process. It involves removing the empty magazine, obtaining a fresh round of ammunition, loading it into the weapon, charging the weapon, getting it back up on target. Those are all precious seconds where victims can be fleeing, the gun can jam, or the suspect could be engaged by law enforcement or bystanders. Knowing the damage that sustained firepower can do, researchers hope their critical findings lead to awareness. Regardless of where one comes down on the gun control debate, it's indisputable that the assault weapon causes significant damage inside the body. Definitely, but this is the reality. This is what's happening. Now, Jake, although the Justice Department says that handguns have been used in most mass shootings, it's important to note that the deadliest mass shooters have opted for this AR-15 style weapon. And you can see why. That ballistic demonstration there in our story shows you the disastrous impact that this weapon can have on the human body. Jake, this weapon that was designed originally for the use by soldiers on the battlefield is now causing unspeakable carnage here at home. Jake. Josh Campbell, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Let's bring in CNN's chief medical correspondent, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, to get the other end of this coverage. Uh, Sanjay, today a pediatrician on the Hill described witnessing what he calls the carnage in my hometown of Uvalde during the hearing. Uh, take a listen. What I did find was something no prayer will ever relieve. Two children whose bodies have been pulverized by bullets fired at them, decapitated, whose flesh had been ripped apart, that the only clue at their identities was a blood splattered cartoon clothes still clinging to them, clinging for life and finding none. Explain, why are bullets from rifles such as an AR-15 or an AR-15 style weapon 
so much more destructive to the human body than others? It, yeah, that's, that's hard to hear, Jake, first of all. But the, it's, it's all about the energy of, of the round, you know. And, and what's interesting is that it's not even necessarily about the size of the, the round, size of the bullet. Some people think it's a bigger bullet. Not necessarily. It can be smaller bullets. It's about the velocity. It's velocity uh, times the, the, the mass of the, the bullet, but it's just going so much faster coming out of one of these uh, AR-15 type rifles that overall the amount of energy that is then transferred into the body is much, much higher. The process that uh, Josh was talking about uh, was something known as cavitation. It literally causes cavities within the body. Uh, whereas a, a, a handgun, for example, much less energy will go straight through a linear line, a bullet-sized line through that with the, with the rifle. Because of that energy, it creates that cavity instead. You have witnessed uh, injuries like these firsthand when you were in, in Iraq covering the war there. Tell us what you saw. Yeah, and you know, when I was in Iraq, you may remember, Jake, that was during the time that there was a ban on these types of weapons. So we weren't seeing a lot of these types of injuries here in the United States. So for the first time for me is, uh, was really on the battlefields. And I mean, it's, it's, it's tough to describe even. I mean, you know, limbs uh, really kind of blown off. People who came in initially into these devil docs camps, the medical camps where I was uh, reporting, a lot of times you couldn't tell initially was it, a, was it a firearm or was it an IED or something. That's how significant the injuries were. I ended up operating on somebody, Jake, uh, who had been shot and it went through the Kevlar of his helmet and landed through the skull into the brain, just to give you an idea again of the, the energy of, of one of these bullets. That is the, the big difference. You talk about, quote, an Emmett Till moment uh, in your essay today on CNN.com. Um, for folks who don't know Emmett Till, if they remember that he was the black teen that was violently murdered uh, in Mississippi in 1955. Um, when he allegedly whistled at a white woman, although that's supposedly, it's actually not true, he didn't do that. Um, his mom, Till's mom, famously insisted on an open casket funeral for him to, quote, let the world see what I've seen. And, and those photos did, uh, they were published in a magazine. What are you hearing in the medical community about AR-15s and the desire to show the American people what they do so the news media and the government is no longer sanitizing this yeah. as these massacres happen. This is a big point of discussion within the uh, people that I've been talking to, the medical community, and there is no consensus on this. There are people who believe those types of images, as with Emmett Till, might make a huge difference, and there's others who think maybe not. I think where there is consensus is it has to be the, the family, fundamentally, that's, that's you know, making this decision. I mean, Emmett Till's mom in that case. It's, it's tough, uh, Jake. I mean, you heard that pediatrician describe some of what they saw in that classroom. I mean, I, if you listen to his words very carefully, it is horrific to think about, to add the imagery to that would be a lot for people to absorb. I mean, even for medical people. But I think, again, the consensus is that it has to be a family's very personal decision. And you know that you think that we in the United States should be treating gun violence as a public health emergency. Explain. Well, I mean, look, if you look overall at what constitutes a public health emergency, a sudden in incidence of increase in uh, violence, injuries, and death, we are certainly seeing that. Uh, over my career as a trauma neurosurgeon, the numbers have gone up significantly. But if you look at the United States, for example, compared to other countries in the world, many people, they know this data. But it's, I mean, it's not even close, right? U.S. ranks first among large high-income countries, 13 times greater than France, 23 times greater than Australia. But for children now under the age of 19, this is the leading cause of death. I mean, it's hard to believe that. In part, it's because automotive accidents have come down to some degree over the years, but gun violence, gun-related injuries have gone up significantly, and that's, that's part of the problem. If you look at the CDC's website, there is a dashboard for COVID, understandably. There is now a dashboard for monkeypox, but there's still not a dashboard for gun violence and, and gun-related deaths. It's still very hard to collect this data, as I found writing the article. News reports, media reports, things like that, local reports, people cobble together to, to create this sort of data. We're not treating it like the public health emergency that it clearly is. Leading cause of death for kids right now, Jake, is this. An absolute disgrace. Dr. Sanjay Gupta, thanks so much. Appreciate it.